sometimes musicians don't work with. So. All right, I hope everyone made it over to say hi to the birthday guy. I'll, I'll say guy. Let's all make our way back in, if you will. I know you're enjoying fellowshipping. You can remain standing, or if you're not standing, please stand with us. We have our song of the month by faith. We have one more time, one more Sunday after today to sing this song as our song of the month. So let's lift our voices together. I think most of you know this song by now. By faith, Hebrews 11 being our faith chapter that we've gone through just recently. But looking forward to the service, prepare our hearts as we think of the words while we sing by faith. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In the the power faith and not by sight. Let's remain standing for our scripture reading. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. If you would need to borrow a Bible this morning, simply raise your hand. We'll be happy to loan one to you as we read together here in Hebrews 11. Our opening reading will be from verse 1 up to verse 6. The Lord willing, we'll cover a little bit more than that in our service today. Hebrews 11, starting in verse number 1, and we'll read up to verse 6. I'll ask when we get to verse 6, I'll ask you to join me in reading this aloud. I'll read from verse 1 to verse 5. Please join me on verse number 6. Scripture tells us here in Hebrews 11, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made, were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6 together. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have called and drawn, and by your grace you have initiated a relationship in that you are calling us to yourself so that we can Without your grace, we would never desire you. We would never want anything to do with you. But because of grace, you've put in us an understanding, a recognition of a need for you. I pray this morning if there's someone with us that has not come to you, may they be seeking you today. May they have the courage to put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. And for we who are your children, we who have that gift of eternal life. May we please you as we walk by faith and not by sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. We've been going through the book of Hebrews and we find back in verse 1 a definition of faith. So we could say that this is foundational to this idea of faith. That's our title for today, A Foundation of Faith. And Jesus gives a, a parable, which we won't turn there today, but he talks about a man that builds a house on a rock and another man that builds his house on sand. And when the storms come, we know the outcome that if it's not on a strong foundation, the house collapses. And the same is true of our faith. It's not the strength of our faith that is so important. It's the strength of the one in whom we place our faith that is important. In my lack of engineering experience, I could have a lot of faith in sand to support a house. And my faith might be very strong, but is sand strong for a foundation? It's not. Strong faith is not the key. Faith in the strong one is the key. So our foundation of faith must be in God. And so our foundation is where things are, are founded. It is where things are based upon. Brother Michael was out yesterday looking at the foundation, looking at the steel in the columns, looking at several things from an engineer's mind in the, in the building of our church building. But do we take that same care and concern when we evaluate our faith? And what are we really trusting in? What is our faith founded upon, the foundation of our faith? Where does it begin from? And I hope it's encouraging you, to you today to realize that our faith is not simply blind faith. It is not something that we just imagine. It's not something that we just have a good, uh, a good feeling about, but there's really no basis for it. No, that's not the faith that we have in God. God has given us a basis. He has given us a reason, and we find that faith is substance. Faith is evidence of things not seen. As we look around us, we see creation, and Romans 1 deals with this as an example of God revealing Himself to us that because of creation, we know that somebody created it. And we read here in verse 3 that through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So we have a basis for our faith. 
We can trust God. And as we look at our lives, as we hear the testimonies of others, even this morning, as we sang about and as we heard testimonies of God's goodness, what God has done, things that would be impossible for us, it is no problem for God, and God has done it. And so faith, there's a substance and there's evidence that has led us to faith, but God wants to work in us. God wants to work through us so that others will see evidence in us. Others will see substance in our lives, and they will also be drawn to faith. So our foundation of faith is who God is. And our foundation of faith also is built on His Word. If we build our foundation on anything else, it's like sand. It is going to collapse. It is going to disappoint us. Sadly, there are people encouraging us to put our faith in them, put our faith in some other institution, but our faith must be in God to accomplish His purpose, not to accomplish ours. So when we think of this God, this God who has created the world, the God who has given us the opportunity to know Him and to come to Him, we must realize this is a good God. And we see His goodness over and over again. And so first, in verses 2 through 5, we see that by faith the elders obtained a good report. And that is because their faith was in a good God and they confessed God's goodness. And our scripture tells us the elders obtained a good report. Uh, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. We see Abel offering a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And he obtained witness that he was righteous. We also see Enoch in verse 5 that God translated him because he had this testimony that he pleased God. Probably you know the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, we don't know all that had happened from the time they were born up until this account in the Word of God. But there came a day that it was time for them to offer sacrifices, and Cain offered uh, the, the fruits, the produce, the agriculture from the field, and Abel offered an animal sacrifice. We don't have the record of how God had given those instructions, but we see the evidence of it in that account that Abel offered the more excellent sacrifice. God accepted Abel's sacrifice. He did not accept Cain's sacrifice. But Scripture tells us here that God testified of his gifts. He obtained witness that he was righteous. Who was the witness of his righteousness? It was God. That's testifying of that. And how did Cain become righteous? Through faith. The same way that Abraham would be made righteous through faith. The same way that Noah would obtain righteousness through faith. The same way you and I obtain righteousness, that is through faith. And so we see that we confess God's goodness when we live righteously. Abel offered that sacrifice. He said, God, you've made me righteous by faith. I'm going to offer this sacrifice to demonstrate my faith, to demonstrate how I received that righteousness. And I'm going to confess, you are a good God. How is his sacrifice a testimony of God's goodness? Remember, all have sinned. Though Cain's murder of Abel is the first murder that we read about in the Bible, it is not the first sin. And we know that Adam and Eve from the garden, as they were thrust out of the garden and they began to produce children, Cain and Abel, they were born with a sin nature. They would have begun to sin the day they were born. And so this is just a culmination. This is just evidence of man's sinfulness, but also of Abel's faith that, God, I'm a sinner. But I'm believing your promise of a deliverer who will pay for my sin. And through his faith, he was made righteous. Did he deserve it? Absolutely not. Do we deserve righteousness? Absolutely not. It's God's goodness 
that offers to us salvation, that offers to us righteousness. In his goodness, he said, I know man will go astray. So I'm going to make a way from the foundation of the world. I'm going to make a way through Jesus Christ, the son, that they can be made righteous, not through their actions, but through God, who is righteous, God, who is good, offering the righteousness to them. Cain and Abel, they each offered a sacrifice. Abel's was an animal. Cain's was crops. Both were sacrificial, but one was true worship. Sometimes we offer sacrifices and we do things and we're saying, God, look, look what I've done. Look, isn't this great? And God is saying, that's not the worship that I expect because worship must be done the way of the one whom we're worshiping. He's the one to decide what it is. He said it should be an animal. We see that picture that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The death of the animal was the picture of of the wages of sin. Abel was offering a sacrifice which demonstrated, which testified, God, I realize I'm a sinner and I realize there's a cost for sin and I'm so grateful for your goodness, for your righteousness that you give by faith. When we confess God's goodness, we do that out of righteousness. And the fact that God has made us righteous gives us cause to confess. Could we become righteous on our own? Can something dirty clean itself? No. It needs something outside of ourselves to clean us. And God is the one that has done that. That's a good God. So our righteousness is a testament of God's goodness. But what happens when we have a righteous life? When we have that good testimony? we see that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice and he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gifts. We see also Enoch had, a, had this testimony, what? That he pleased God. When we have a good testimony, when there's a good report, when there is evidence of righteousness in us, a good testimony gives us influence so that we can have a good witness. A good witness. And we see witness also illustrated in these verses. When Cain offered the right sacrifice, and Abel, I'm sorry, Cain offered the wrong sacrifice, and Abel offered the right sacrifice, Abel was annoyed. Abel was annoyed because, I mean, Cain was annoyed. I'm sorry, I'm getting my names confused. Let me start over. Cain offered the wrong sacrifice. Abel offered a good sacrifice. Abel's was accepted. Cain's was rejected. And Cain was annoyed. Not because Abel had righteousness, but because his sacrifice was accepted. But the very fact that Abel was living in righteousness, it was a witness to Cain that he's not living in righteousness. Our righteousness is light, is is how Scripture talks about it in Matthew 5. Let your light so shine before men. Why do they need light? Because they are in darkness. But the darkness hateth the light. Our righteousness should be a contrast to those in the darkness, in sin, in wickedness. It should be a witness to them that there is something greater than me. There's somebody that I'm worshiping, somebody that I'm not offering an animal sacrifice, but offering a living sacrifice because there's a good God that is worthy and there's a good God that has offered a way of righteousness. And if you do not have his righteousness, you are condemned already. There's a witness that comes and our influence increases when we have that good testimony. I think of the time of Enoch. Enoch's uh, Enoch's father was a name named Methuselah. Anybody heard that? Do you know anybody named Methuselah? Anybody? You know, some people know somebody named Methuselah. I don't know whether they will match their namesake's age. 
Uh, <clears throat> there's a phrase, a, a little rhyme I learned growing up. The oldest man who ever lived, that was Methuselah. He lived 969 years. The oldest man who ever lived died before his father did. Who was Methuselah's father? Enoch. Enoch never died. So the oldest man who ever lived, he died before his father died. Seems a bit confusing. Because his father didn't die. He was translated. Uh, and so Enoch had a son, Methuselah. The name Methuselah means when he dies, it shall come. Boy, that sounds a little scary, doesn't it? In the very year that Methuselah died, the flood came upon the earth. Enoch, Methuselah, they were living in a time of great wickedness. Let's go back to Cain and Abel. Let's put Adam and Eve aside. We don't really know where they are spiritually at this point. But as far as their children, 50% of the population was living in wickedness. Abel and Cain. Cain was wicked. Abel was righteous, right? So 50%. Do you think that's some pressure to join in wickedness? So they were both living in wicked times. Abel had a brother that was wicked, rebelling against God. Enoch was living in a time that there was much wickedness. It was increasing to the point that a few generations later, we have, uh, we have Enoch and then Methuselah, Lamech, and then Noah and his children that God would destroy the world. And there's a testimony that comes, a witness that comes even amongst, amongst a wicked people. So we can confess God's goodness, but sometimes we, we look at our, the situations around us and we feel like there's too much wickedness, there's too much pressure, there's too much challenge, but we can still report, we can still testify that our God is good no matter the circumstances. Oh, but the people that I'm with, they don't believe in God. They don't fear God. I believe that's what Enoch faced. Definitely his descendant Noah faced that. Abel didn't have much consolation from Cain. In fact, Cain killed him. They lived in a wicked time. But they professed that our God is good. Our God has given us, has offered to us righteousness. And there's a faith. There's substance to faith. There's evidence. God, I don't know who that deliverer is, but I'm going to trust you. And Abel pleased God. Enoch pleased God. Not knowing that, this, that the Son of God would come in the person of Jesus Christ to die for their sins. They didn't know that He'd be called Jesus. They didn't know that He'd be born in Bethlehem of a virgin. They didn't know that He would be despised and rejected. But they knew that God had promised, I will send someone to pay for your sin. And they believed in God's promise. And by faith, they were made righteous when those around them rejected. There's a righteousness that we've been given by faith in God. And we can confess God's goodness. But not only can we confess God's goodness, we can come to this good God. Notice, starting in verse 6, he says, we read this earlier, Without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, that would be rain, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abram, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in a land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We can come to this good God, but we must come by faith. Again, God is drawing all men to him. 
He's offering this gift of eternal life, this salvation, but those that come to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We need to come to God, but we come by faith. Just as Noah came by faith, Abraham came by faith. We'll see in, in the next few verses, Sarah came by faith. And because we know we have access to a good God, we should come. And we come to Him saying, God, what, you are the good God. You are the righteous God. God, you need to be in control of my life. And so there's, there's a principle here of some self-control that comes because of that righteousness. But self-control is not myself in control, by the way. Self-control is God in control of my self. So the question then is this, are you his? Does he have control of yourself? There are times that we can say, God, I'm going to trust you for my salvation, but I need to deal with these daily things. Is that what Noah did? Noah believed God. And God said, I'm going to destroy this world with a flood. So Noah, I want you to build not just a boat, a ship. Did that make sense logically? Okay, if you know what rain is, that would make sense. Uh, in, in the United States recently, they had some storms. And in one area, in, in just like 24 hours, they had, uh, what, about 70 centimeters of rain in one day. Uh, the entire, it was in the mountains, the water ran down then. So the buildings were covered and actually washed completely away. And that was just in one day of rain. We know about rain. We know about flooding. But in Noah's day, they'd never seen rain. They didn't know about rain. He had to trust God. And God is saying, this is what I want to do through you, Noah. I want to build a big ship. And I want to bring all the animals two by two, some of them seven. And I want to preserve these species into uh, through this storm that I'm going to send. And you and your family, I'm going to start over with you. Does that, does that make sense? Just the first time we hear that, if we don't know the story of Noah. I mean, think if you or I, think if, if you had been Noah, men, or Noah's wife. And Noah comes and says, dear, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build this boat. Because God's going to send water from the sky. And all the animals are going to come. Two of each animal are going to come and get in the boat with us. Uh, you might love your husband and trust your husband, but would you have some questions for your husband, ladies? <laughs> Self-control is not myself being in control. Self-control is God. You're in control of me. And you may ask me to do things that do not make sense. You may ask me to do things that my wife says, are you sure that's God? Because it doesn't make sense to us. But we have a God that we can come to and trust Him to guide us. But He says, without faith, notice verse 6, we read this earlier, without faith, it is really, really hard to please Him. Is that what your Bible says? Without faith, it's what? It's impossible to please Him. Noah, build this ship. I don't understand. Trust me, Noah, build this ship. Was there any other thing Noah could have done to please God? No, God had said, Build, do this. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. It doesn't make sense. God, I'm going to do it. Abram, I want you to leave your home where all your family is. Everything is comfortable. You know, you know where all the shops are. You know where to get help. You have a good support network. I want you to leave this and go somewhere else. Where am I going, God? The place that I will show you. Wow, that really helps. Dear, God told us to pack up. We're going to leave. Where are we going, uh, Abram? I'm not sure, Sarah, but we're just going to follow God. What's going to be there when we get there? I don't know. We're, would it be a little bit challenging, ladies, to trust your husband? I mean, we think of Noah and we think of Abraham, but honestly, I think the wives had, had the greater faith. Because Noah and Abraham, they heard from God. And the wife is saying, mm-hmm, yeah, you heard from God, didn't you? But because of their righteousness, they had a good testimony. 
even among their, their wife. They have that influence that I'm not in control. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to be in control of things. Like, I would love to be in control of the finances for our church building. To know that, okay, this money's coming here, and this money's coming here, and okay, we can... Wouldn't that be nice if we could just control that as a church and program it, and we call Baroni and say, okay, this money will be here on this date, so make sure you're... But we're not in control of that. Because we're not in control of the building either. God may give us this building, but it's not ours, it's His. I, I know of some Christians, godly Christians that have raised children that have gone astray. And we realize we're not really in control of our children. We're not in control of what happens in our community. So why do we want to be in control of our own lives? We're not good at controlling other things. Noah and Abram, and I would add to that Noah's wife and Sarah, trusted God to control themselves. God said, go here. God said, do this. It doesn't make sense. There was going to be rejection. But because of trust, they obeyed. By faith, Abram, when he was called to go out, verse 8 says, into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. But there's really not much else there. He simply obeyed. There is some control that we give over to God because we trust Him to be a good God and we can come to Him with our lives and say, God, here I am. You be in control. But even when we do that and God says, hey, I'm going to do something great through you, does He give us the calendar with the notifications that this is in one hour and this is in six hours and this is... Wouldn't that be nice? Again, that's the control that I like. I like to know this is happening on this day at this time. I plan for it. But they went out not knowing. God told Noah, build an ark. Then it came the day God said, get in the ark. And God closed the door. But it didn't start raining that day. Noah's sitting in the ark with the door shut with the animals. Nothing. Sleeps, wakes up the next morning. Nothing. Seven days. He's sitting in the ark. I can just imagine what the neighbors. Hey, Noah. I've got that umbrella you told me to get. Noah didn't know when the rain was coming. God said, build the boat. God said, go inside. Sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, we have to trust God's control, but we have to trust God's timing. It requires patience. It requires patience. Verse 11, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful. Who had promised? God had promised God, I'm old. God had promised. She judged him faithful. But it was still years later before Isaac was born. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Verse 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Because the promise to Sarah was not so much, Sarah, you're going to have a baby because I'm going to bless you. It wasn't about the baby. The promise was that in thy seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It was that through you, through Adam, I mean, through Abram and Sarah, there would be a child. And that child would have another son who would have another son. And eventually, through that line, God would give the deliverer that Abel looked for. The deliverer that Noah looked for, the deliverer that Abram had trusted in and been given righteousness by faith that God said, I will give one who will pay for your sins, the deliverer that God promised all the way back in Genesis 3. 
But all of these died in faith, not having received. They couldn't see, oh, this is the child that was going to be born. God promised Adam that God would send a seed that would destroy the serpent. It was 4,000 years later. Talk about patience, right? 4,000 years later before God sent that son. Noah waited. Abel waited. Abram waited. Sarah waited by faith, trusting God. There are some things physically in our lives we have to wait on God and trust. But there are other things that God is saying, you just have to trust me even when you don't see it. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. And faith is the evidence of things not seen. How is that? Well, God, I've seen you do this and this and this and this. So by faith, I know you will do what you promised. I have the evidence. There is actually substance to it. It's not just wishful thinking, but I have a basis because of your promises of what you've said. I know I have a home in heaven, for example. Jesus said, and if I go... I go to, what, prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. And if I go, I will come again and do what? Receive you unto myself. How do I know? How do I have assurance that that is there? Because Jesus has done everything else that he has said. He is the God who cannot lie. And so I have that faith that, God, I don't know when I'm going to get to that city. I don't know when I'm going to get to that place that you've prepared for me, but I have confidence that it's there. So meantime, I can be faithful to you here. Not getting distracted, but we can look and we can love his appearing. We know that Old Testament believers, they were looking forward to Christ's first coming. We can look back and see that Christ has come. We have substance. We have evidence for our faith, but we are also looking ahead to his second coming. And we can have just as much confidence in his second coming as we have in the first coming because our confidence is not in our faith. Our confidence is the one who promised he will come. And so we can wait for that. We can trust him and we can be patient. But Pastor Dan, I'm going through this challenge. I think these men went through challenges. Pastor Dan, I've got opposition. My family doesn't understand. Noah's family didn't understand. Abel's family didn't understand. Cain killed him. But they had patience to trust God. We can come to God and trust that He is good even when we don't understand what He's calling us to do. Even when we don't understand His time. We can give control to Him. And we can be patient as we wait on Him. But as we patiently wait... He doesn't want us just to sit idly. He wants us to consider the future. He wants us to consider the future. Verse 13 says, All of these died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The ark that Noah built didn't bring the deliverer but it preserved the line of men that would bring the deliverer. The land that God promised to Abram did not bring the deliverer, but the deliverer would be given in that land. The child, Isaac, that God promised was not the deliverer, but through Isaac and then through Jacob and through Judah, through those descendants, the deliverer would come. And they would have the eternal life that they were seeking. And these verses show us that they were seeking, verse 14 says, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, not of this world, not a physical country. Verse 16 says it is a heavenly country. See, Abraham had physical wealth. We see evidence of that over and over in Scripture. But his hope and his confidence was not in that physical wealth, but he used those resources to prepare for the promise that was afar off. To come to the land that God had given them, to prepare the place for the Messiah to come in the future. There was a godly focus that they maintained. Noah, Abraham, leading their families 
looking to the future and trusting God not to give them everything that they could hope for in this life, but to give them a hope of eternal life through the deliverer that would come. So they're looking to the future eternally of what God is going to do, but they also look to the future even within their own families. And I noticed something in these verses. I noticed something in these verses that I'm, I'm calling family unity, but at first it doesn't seem like unity. In, uh, in verse uh, 20, we see that Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Now, when we think about Jacob and Esau, is unity the first word that comes to your mind for the two of them? When we think of the sons of Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob, and their love for Joseph, does unity come to your mind? It doesn't. But notice what Scripture tells us. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Their blessing was for the future. They both received a blessing. And even though the older would serve the younger, and the younger would be greater and there would be conflict within that, we find that there was a hope that, that Isaac had that Jacob and Esau would work things out, that there would be unity because of faith. And we find, I, I believe there's evidence to suggest Esau did have faith in God uh, through, through later passages of Scripture. I can't say that for sure. Definitely Jacob expressed faith in God and it's that faith that brought unity in their family. They both enjoyed a blessing even though the older would serve the younger. Even as we think of Joseph and the brothers rejected him but eventually, eventually there was forgiveness, there was restoration, there was repentance and there was a unity so much so that Joseph could trust not just his descendants but the children of Israel as, as a whole to take his bones with them when they left Egypt. That there would be unity. That they would see themselves as a people and not just the divisions that used to be there. And when we have this godly focus, when we have this view for the future, there may be issues that come up between brothers and sisters in Christ, brothers and sisters in a home, but when we look past ourselves and we give control of those situations to our God, then there's a unity that comes in that looks to the future and trusts God to redeem the situation, to bring repentance because we've been forgiven, we can offer forgiveness. And we see through Isaac and his children, through Jacob and his children, the evidence. It gives us hope. It gives us hope that there can be unity where there's been disunity because of a common faith and deliverance through Jesus Christ when we have that eternal view instead of trying to seek for our own selves right now. So how do we get there? How do we come from where we are, where there's conflict, where we're surrounded by wickedness, where there are challenges, we are oppressed, God's asking us to do things that don't make sense, or God's timetable it's just requiring patience. How do we keep moving forward amidst all these issues? Well, we have to continue in the same faith where we began. That faith is foundational to all of this. And for time, we, don't, we can't go deep into these verses, but verse 23 tells us of Moses, that he was hid three months of his parents. And he believed in the true God. Notice, uh, let me see, down in verse... 25, that Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for season. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt. Through faith, he kept the Passover. We see Moses obeying God despite Pharaoh, who offered him riches in that home, but he, he left Egypt, identified with the people of God, and suffered for it. 
And he comes back to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says, who is this God? But Moses maintained his faith. And God tells him to, to do these signs and wonders to deliver Egypt. He tells the children of Israel, slaughter this lamb, put the blood on the top and on the, the doorposts and a basin at the bottom. And the death angel is going to come and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now we look back and we see the picture of Christ's death and we see his deliverance, but they hadn't seen or heard anything from God for 400 years. And now this guy comes and says, kill a lamb, put the blood on the lintel and on the doorpost, a basin at the bottom, put your shoes on, unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And they're like, what? Did it make sense? How does blood on the doorpost deliver us from Egypt? It wasn't logical. But they had to trust God. They had to give control of themselves to God. They had to have a view for the future and not for the immediate. And there's a love for God that results, that comes out of our faith. And, and Moses here had a love for God's people. He had a love for God's people that led him to serve. It led him to sacrifice his privilege in Egypt. It led him to surrender, saying, God, however you want to use me, because he loved God's people. And as he loved the people, and he was willing to suffer with them, it demonstrated the love for God. And it's the result of the love for God. Just like Abel, who had a good report. Just like Noah, who acted on faith. Just like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they're looking for the eternal because God is the only true God who can do all things. We can trust Him. And because we trust Him, we can obey Him. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. But when we believe Him and He calls us to go, we can go out not knowing, but simply to obey. Even when we're surrounded by unbelievers, like Noah was, like Abel was. But notice down in verse 30, we see Jericho. The walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Talk about a war plan that doesn't make sense. All right, soldiers, God wants us to walk around for seven days. Nobody say a word. We're going to defeat the city. Does it make sense? March around... What is God doing? I would guess by third, fourth day, maybe even the, maybe even the first day, they were murmuring, what is, what is Joshua doing? This doesn't make sense. Give control to God, patience. But what's the result? Verse 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Rahab was in a wicked city, surrounded by wicked people. Unbelievers. Her profession would have made her a bit of an outcast. But she saw the testimony of those who were righteous. And when the spies came, she said, we've heard what your God has done. And I believe. She perished not with them that believed not. A love for God can give us a faith even when we're surrounded by others who don't believe. She was probably the most outcast. Maybe it's the most outcast who have the least to lose. And it's easier for them to believe. I don't know. But what is it that is keeping us from trusting God? Maybe you've never trusted God for salvation. It is only through faith in Jesus Christ that our sins can be paid for, that we can have deliverance. If you've never received his gift of eternal life, it's impossible for you to please him. But even we who have received his gift, we have that the Holy Spirit living in us. We still must live by faith to please him. Despite what others say, despite what others put their trust in, we can and we must trust this true God, this unseen God, but trust him to do his will, not to do our will, not for me to be in control, but for him to be in control of ourself. See, Satan wants to bind us to our own understanding. Abel, 
Abel's bringing an animal, but Cain, it's okay to bring the crops. Just bring what you have. It's okay. God will accept whatever you give him. Satan wants to bind us to our own understanding. Satan wants to bind us to the pleasures of sin like Noah's neighbors. To what is immediate like Joseph's brothers. Let's get the money for this boy and sell him to the Midianites. He wants to bind us to what we can see like Pharaoh who says, And who is the God that can deliver you out of my hand? But Jesus Christ sets us free to trust God. We're in Hebrews. I'm going to turn over just a couple books to 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll read verse 5 through 7 as we close this morning. When we read 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 5, we see that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice that now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness. Perhaps that's you this morning. I'm in heaviness. There are manifold temptations. But he says that the trial of your faith, the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Verse 8 continues, whom having not seen, ye love. Our love for God, it can help us continue in faith. And we can trust the God of the word. He's the only true God. We can trust him. We can trust him and we can trust that God with our future. Abraham, I want you to go. Go where? I'll show you. That is trust. But he has our eternity. Certainly we can trust him with our tomorrow. We can trust that God with our obedience. That is the result of true faith. But not only trust God because he is good. Don't redefine good. God is good. That is our definition. Not for us to bring our own ideas, but God is good. So what he wants to do, what he wants to, to lead, where he wants me to go, what control he wants to bring, what patience he, he requires of me, I can trust God because he is good. Heavenly Father, I think it would be fair to assume that everyone in this room has experienced some challenge, some trial, some manifold temptation, even this week. We've needed your wisdom. We've needed your forgiveness, your grace, your long suffering and mercy. And probably we've needed to extend that to someone else. May we have the eternal view. May we have a love for you that causes us to love others. May we trust you with the challenges, trust you with the things that do not make logical sense, the things that we don't understand why you're allowing it to happen, but trust that you have a good purpose because you are good and you are faithful and you are working in unseen ways. And though we don't have proof of what you're doing tomorrow, we have the evidence of what you've done before and the substance of who you are living in us and we can trust you but may that trust lead us to obedience to faithfulness may it give us because of your righteousness may we have that testimony that gives us influence to be a witness to others may you draw others to your son through us. Well, there's so much more we could have studied today, Father, but even what we've learned, it challenges us and may it change us to be more like you. But it's impossible to be like you without you in us. So, Father, I pray for those among us this morning that have never come to Christ through faith alone. 
our good works cannot save us. It is only the work of Jesus Christ that's good. And that He died for our sins and offers to us Your righteousness as a gift by faith. Father, I pray for those among us today that have never received that gift. Give them courage to come and let us show them from Your Word how they can receive Your gift today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.